Welcome to Christmas Eve at Central Church. We are a Jesus church where everyone is welcome, where no one is perfect, and of course, where everyone is loved. May in this evening you experience the joy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came into this world. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then, one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight-note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses? She said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. And that's when I realized the good news she was talking about.
Francis Dorf wrote this beautiful story called The Rabbi's Gift. In the story, he tells the tale of a, a wonderful monastery that was, that was always vibrant and strong and alive. And, and young monks came to study there and, and people came to pray there and be blessed there. But over time, it, it, it lost some of its joy and its passion. And slowly but surely, the young people disappeared and and people didn't come to the monastery that often anymore. And, and it kind of just tethered down to a, a small group of monks and the abbot that stayed behind. And they, they, at some stage, you could see that they were doing their work there with, with heavy hearts and, and as a burden. They were struggling. In the meantime, on the edge of the woods that, that was around the monastery, an old rabbi had moved into a hut, built a little hut there, moved in. And every now and then he would come and visit at the monastery, and there would be a little bit of a buzz when he was there. One day, the old abbot decided he was going to visit the rabbi. He, he journeyed to the edge of the woods, came to the rabbi's little hut, and, and as, he, as he came closer, the rabbi stood in the door with arms wide open and welcoming him, saying, come on in, come on, I'm so glad to see you. And, and they went and they sat at the table and they opened the word and they, they read the word together and they prayed and then they started crying, both of them. And then the rabbi looked at the, at the abbot and he said, I know that you are doing your work with heavy hearts and it's become a burden for you. And, and you have come to me today to ask for a word. And I have a word for you. But here's the important thing about the word. I'm going to say this to you and you are only allowed to repeat what I have said to you once. And after that, you are never allowed to speak about it again. So he leaned forward and he looked into the abbot's eyes and he said to him, the Messiah is among you. For a moment, the abbot was kind of stunned. The old rabbi got up and opened the door and, and the abbot left, walking with just his thoughts, never looking back. The next morning, he called the, uh, the monks together for a meeting, and he said, I went to visit the rabbi, and I asked him for a word. And this is the word he gave me, and we can only say this today, and after this, we are not allowed to talk about it again. And they all listened intently, and he looked at him, and he said, the rabbi said that the Messiah is among us. And there was a silence. And then you saw them kind of looking around, and they were thinking, could it be that it could be Brother Matthew? Or was it maybe Brother James? Or, or maybe was it, was it Brother John? But none of them knew. But all of a sudden, they started treating each other with, with grace and with love and with kindness and just caring for each other. And there was a new joy in their lives, looking at each other, working with each other. And their, their lives become more vibrant and alive and and all of a sudden, people who came to visit there felt a new vibrancy there. And they started talking, and more people came to visit the monastery again. And, and all of a sudden, young people came to study again and, and work there again. And, 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 and this monastery all of a sudden was thriving again. In the meantime, the old rabbi was gone. No one saw him again. Just a little hut that stood there. No one living there. But always when they spoke of him, they said, we feel as if his presence is there among us. Now, I tell you this story because I think it's, it's a good example uh, of a heading for the story that I am going to read you this evening. And, and yes, for Christmas Eve, we always have one of the Christmas stories, but I'm not going to read that, going completely off kilter a little bit here. Going to Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 to 42 in the New Living Translation. Jesus speaking to the disciples, uh, telling them that he's sending them out. And when he sends them out, this is what he expects. Anyone who receives you, receives me. And anyone who receives me, receives the Father who sent me. 
if you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as the prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Notice a few things in this. Jesus starts this, this story off, uh, it's, it's this missionary discourse, as we call it, where he sends them off. Uh, he starts it off with, with a warning, a little earlier in the chapter, where he says to them, so I'm sending you out, but can I tell you something? You're going in my name, you're going to represent me, but don't expect people just to like you because of that. You're actually going to find the opposite, where you speak in my name and you knock on doors in my name, they will often slam the door in your face. You will often be ridiculed and laughed at. You will be at some stage be persecuted because you speak of me and live for me. So go with caution. But then, and here's the two things that I want you to hold on to. Then he also gives them a word of comfort. And we read that in verse 40, the first verse that we read. Anyone who receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives my Father, who sent me. So go, he says. Because as you go, you are not going alone. I'm going with you. I will be there every step of the way. And when you speak to people and you speak my words and they experience those words and they take those words, they will be blessed because you have spoken my words and allowed me to speak through you. When you touch people's lives and their lives turn around, you will receive the blessing of that too. That is your comfort because I am going with you. And how blessed will you be when you realize that sometimes you will meet the smallest in my kingdom. And when you see me in them and you love them and you even give them a cup of water... There will be a blessing in that for you because I am going with you. And on this way, you will meet me again. And you will see me again in so many different ways. Because Messiah is among you. And here's the thing, my friends. Can you see what Jesus is saying here to each one of us? Whenever you speak in my name, he says, it is as if the Father is speaking himself. Whenever you witness to people, it is as if the Holy Spirit himself is the one who is bringing that witness. Whenever your hands become hands of healing and gentleness and kindness and giving and care, it is as if the hands of the Messiah has touched those people. For I am with you. Messiah is amongst you. But there's also a warning in this whole passage again. Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't always come in the way that we expect Jesus to come. I've often wondered if I was a journalist in those days and I had my little book that I was writing down all the things about Jesus, what I would have written about him and whether I would have realized that he really was the Messiah. Because here's the thing. He was just a regular person. And you found him with all the regular people. He doesn't always come and appear in the way that we expect Messiah. Let me ask you this. And, and, and let's be a little honest when we ask this, right? Imagine you were there on that evening. And you walked into that stable or that manger. And there's this little baby Lying 
there. Would you have looked at him and thought honestly? There is the Son of God, the Messiah. When you, when you listened to this little baby and you heard those little baby cries, would you have thought in that moment that's the same voice that spoke this whole creation, you and me, into being, who said, let there be light, and there was light? Would you have thought when you looked at that little baby's little hand clutching a mother's finger that those were the same hands who measured the waters of this earth in the palm of his hands, who held the mountains and built those mountains with his own hands? If we're honest, my friends, not many of us would have believed that and have thought that. Because you see, that's the thing about Messiah. He doesn't always come in the way that we expect him. But if we take a moment and we look closely, we might find that Messiah is among us in the places that we would least look for him. And that happened during his life in this world, during his ministry. He looked just like one of us. John says the word became flesh and he looked and lived like one of us. He didn't walk on a cloud with a halo around his head with angels blowing trumpets all around him and everyone knew, here is the Messiah. He was just a man. A man whose feet got dirty and needed to be washed. A man who got tired and needed to sleep. A man who got hurt and could cry. A man who could see brokenness and have compassion. A man who would sit with sinners and heal the broken and love those on the periphery and on the fringes. And maybe that was the problem. Why so many did not see Messiah was among them. Because Messiah didn't come the way that they expected. They expected this warrior that would come on his stallion and would take over. And then they saw a suffering servant. They wanted a winemaker, bread maker. Miracle worker, a user-friendly Jesus, and found one who did the work of God. They were looking for a king and found a man who was hanging on a cross to give his life, for he truly was Messiah. The question is, where do we look for Messiah? And how do we look for Messiah? Do I see him in the one who knocks at my door and maybe needs just a cup of water? One of the least in the kingdom. Do I hear him in the voices that are lonely and struggling and hurting and needy? Do I see him in the eyes of a little child, just smiling and loving? Do I hear him in the broken voice of an old person, just speaking of love and care? For Messiah is amongst us. We just need the right eyes. In, in his book, uh, God Came Near, uh, Max Lucado, Lucado writes a, a little something about this. He says, for 51 years, Bob Edens was blind. He couldn't see a thing. His world was a black hall of sounds and smells. He felt his way through five decades of darkness. And then he could see. A skilled surgeon performed a complicated operation. And for the first time, Bob Edens had sight. He found it overwhelming. I never would have dreamed that yellow is so yellow, he exclaimed. 
I don't have the words. I'm amazed by yellow, but red is my favorite color. I just can't believe red. And I can see the shape of the moon. And I like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky, leaving a vapor trail. And of course, sunrises and sunsets. And at night, I look at the stars in the sky and the flashing light. You could never know how wonderful everything is. And here's the thing. There is so much more. To see in this creation and be stunned and overwhelmed at. But the question is, Messiah is among us. Do I see him? Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming when you came. 
Thank you for the way in which you came, for you know us, you understand us, you walked with us. Sometimes, Lord, in this world you are there, and we are so busy that we don't see you. Sometimes you are there, and we just don't look and we don't see you. Open our eyes, Lord, that we can see Jesus. Open our ears that we might hear his voice. And then take our hands and take our lives and let them become lives that live Jesus. For we are people of Advent who know that Messiah is among us. For Messiah had come. And we glorify your name. Amen. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round the unvirgin mother and child. It was wonderful to spend this evening with you. And as you go into this weekend and as you live up to Christmas, may you find joy in your families. May you find joy in this time of Christmas, knowing that Messiah had come. And as you find this joy, remember God's promise. That the grace of our Lord, our Messiah, the one who came to be among us, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, our Father, the one who sent him to be among us. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and shows Messiah through us will be with you today, tomorrow, 
and every day. Amen. Thank you.